So uh, thank you very much. So I would like first to uh, warmly thank the organizer of this uh, virtual conference. Indeed, with Johnny, Luca, and Agnese, who are also here on the Zoom, we are very glad to present this recent data from ongoing archaeological excavation in this session. So this presentation is approaching innovation in ancient pyrotechnology and aims to highlight actually three paradigm shifts. So the first one, epistemological, the second, technological, and the third, economic. The first paradigm is epistemological because surprisingly, few considerations have been given to the uses and importance of pyrotechnology in ancient Mesopotamian societies. Indeed, uh, the, the kiln history suffers of many documentary gaps. We know that the first kilns appear in the second half of the seventh millennium BC at the end of the Neolithic period. However, that technological development is loosely documented. Yet, pottery was the most consumed utilitarian goods after agricultural products and the most widespread crafts involving a considerable amount of resources, time and energy. Therefore, the pottery industry has to be considered as an economic mainstay and not a minor heart of the ancient societies. Our presentation focuses on the chronological period of the first Mesopotamian empires, namely Akkad and all three, corresponding to the second half of the third millennium. Recent excavation in the northeastern part of Iraq revealed the existence of two large manufacturers of pottery gathering tens of potters and using a very complex system of kiln to fire pottery. These manufacturers produced a wide range of common pottery from, from big jars to small vessels. First, Aliawa in the Erbil Plain, where three levels of a large pottery industry dated from the late Akkadian period were excavated by the Italian expedition in the Erbil Plain, directed by Luca Peronel. And second, Logardan in the Karadak foothills, where five levels of a pottery industry dated from the post Akkadian period to the early beginning of the second millennium, were excavated by the Mission du Karadak, directed by Grigis Vallée and now by the, by the French archaeological mission in the Western Karadag, directed, directed by Johnny Baldi. These two manufacturers are not strictly contemporaneous, but share a lot of commonalities. During the late Akkad period, Aliawa was located on the border of the empire, and the manufacture was functioning. At this time, Logardan was not yet a pottery manufacturer, but a hilltop citadel, probably occupied by Akkadian officials, on the road of the King Naramsin campaign. After the fall of the Akkadian Empire, King Onamu created another expansionist empire named after its capital, the city of Ur. Of Ur. By this time, we have evidence of a large manufacturing area at Logardan, while the productive area of Aliawa seems to have been abandoned. We see on the map that both Aliawa and Logardan were not strictly inside of the border of the Ur Free Empire but at the fringe of a buffer zone populated by poorly known kingdoms of the mountains like the Lulubum. The low relief of Shulgi, one of the last king of, uh, one of the, last king of uh, the Orthri Empire, uh, carved in a mountain pass in Darabandigor, show that the zone was not totally controlled by the, the empire, but more revendicated. Therefore, these pottery workshops are remarkable on the one hand by their location and on the other hand for the concentration of dozens of kilns clearly perceptible by the presence of large circular feature on the drone photo. Indeed, these kilns are half buried structure which the, of which the upper part is hardly ever preserved. Usually, kiln, a kiln is, is constructed in brick and is uh, characterized by two chambers, a combustion chamber where the fire is lightened and the hot gases burn, and a firing chamber where the pots are stored on a pierce grate to be fired. So the heat follow a vertical drop from the combustion to the firing chamber. However, in Aliawa and Logardan, the combustion chamber of several kilns were connected together through ducts allowing the hot gases to move horizontally between several kilns. From a technical point of view, 
the kiln connection requires on a large scale a planification of the workplace and allows to optimize the use of the fuel and the heat in order to fire thousands of pots in one firing cycle. From a social point of view, it acknowledges a collaboration of several potters for the building of the workplace and the firing. So this type of connection between kilns that we are going to see and explain better is not totally new, but before the third millennium, it has never been used on such a large scale. Indeed, this innovation was first attested at the beginning of the fourth millennium in Girdikala, an archeological site just 1.5 kilometers southeast of Logardon. Then how this collaboration between the potters became possible and why did they choose to use this firing innovation? So as we said, the first connected kilns are dated from the beginning of the fourth millennium. And in the level seven of Girdikala, we see the three kilns eroded until the level of the grates. We notice that the combustion chambers were linked the one to another in a chain-like connection from the smaller kiln in the back to the larger kiln in the front. The ducts crossing through the wall were reinforced with stones to protect the wall from the intense heat going through. So the ducts are situated in the upper part of the combustion chamber of the kiln. We notice that in this system of three, each kiln has a combustion chamber and a firing chamber. Therefore, the system is much more efficient if each kiln is lightened at a different time. So the heat produced by the first one, who is started first, um, has time to warm the two others and slowly drain their pot. Less fuel is used in each kiln, which is especially cost-effective for the first phase of the firing that is the longest and requires a slow increase in temperature. So during the fourth millennium, only two or three kilns are integrated in connected systems. In the second half of the third millennium, large-scale manufacture started as a concentration of several groups of potters. In Aliawa and Logardon, we notice a gradual process of integration of different groups of potters with a more and more intense collaboration in the firing using connection between kilns. So in Aliawa, during the Akkadian period, the workshop is organized with several kilns. Up to now, 50 kilns have been excavated, built on sloping terrace and sustained by retaining wall and platforms. First, potters employed a system of kilns built together in a chain-like connection, as we saw in Girdikala fitted for limited cluster of kilns. The firing structures shared their walls, so they were definitely built together, and a duct was crossing through it. Of course, the duct of 10 cm in diameter is not enough to be the only source of it for the last kiln of the chain. So each kiln was equipped with its own mouth and was probably lightened at different times. Then potters developed another system of star-shaped connection. So this picture illustrates K74, a massive kiln with juxtaposed chamber, of which the firing chamber is almost five meter in diameter. So um, here, the firing chamber is here, it is the largest, and the combustion chamber is here. So the both, both chambers are on the same level and there is a horizontal draw between the two. This kiln is the connective point of three branches of the system. That's why we call it star-shaped system. On the eastern side, it was connected toward two firing structures through ducts. And on the western side, it was connected to a pierced platform that we'll describe later. We see that the ducts open in the upper part of K74. They were not air pumps to draw the heat inside, but flues to expel the heat toward the other kilns. Indeed, they were intended for improving the internal draught of K74, but also conducting heat to smaller kilns connected to it. The wall of K48 here is completely burned and very green and vitrified, indicating an intense heat. In the southern connection, we found a slag of pottery, so a piece of ceramic completely melted by the intensity of the heat, attached to the wall of the ducts showing also 
uh, the high temperature that have been reached inside. Moreover, below the floor of this massive kiln, we noticed several ducts that were probably going from the firebox towards the bottom of the kiln, allowing to better distribute, it, to better distribute the heat in the firing structure through a very interesting kind of heating floor system. In addition, the very large kiln K74 was also connected to the west to a brick platform uh, on which uh, that was probably used to dry the pots. Indeed, we, you can see here the brick platforms with holes on the top and also holes on the eastern side. It's like an open area grate, actually. So the ducts, from another view, you see here the wall of the kiln, and here the brick platform. And the ducts were crossing the massive wall of the kiln and going under this platform uh, to dry the pot that, that was stored on it. We see that one of the ducts was not protected with stone like we see in Girdikala, but with a reused neck of pottery jar. Then in Logardan, in level 382, several ducts connected, connect, were connecting kilns together, both in chain-like and star-shaped-like connection. They were running under the platform and were protected with stones. Potters created an intertwined system that could also be segmented using stones to plug the ducts. For example, in kiln 920, we saw that one stone was used to block the heat arrival. It has the diameter of the duct, and uh, the part of it was blackened with, with soot. In level two, dated from the very beginning of the second millennium, several ducts were connected kills to, um, sorry, the, um, we found the massive structures of probably seven meters in diameters, but completely eroded in the slope. We suppose it was a juxtaposed chamber kiln similar to K74 uh, with, that we saw in Aliawa using the step of the hill to enhance the horizontal draw. Moreover, a duct was crossing the wall and was connected to a superposed chamber kiln. So again, you can see inside the duct a, sl a pottery slag attached to the wall. This kiln was also connected to, another, to other structures in the same area through an ingenious system of channels conveying the heat through the bottom of the firing chambers. Again, we found here the technique of the heating floor system identified in Aliawa. Then, while the pots at the beginning of the chain were started to be fired, the pots at the, at the end of the chain just start to receive heat and to dry slowly. In the, and to dry slowly. In the same level, there was another big kiln here with superposed chambers. So the northeastern part of the kiln was completely destroyed by a looting pit. However, on the remaining wall, we notice two successive levels of grates. Of course, the two grates were not contemporaneous, so they were not used at the same time. The, but the second level, the upper one, is a reconstruction of the first one. Above the level of the second grate, you can see here several duct openings are visible. And you can also notice that the clay around the duct was completely gray, completely burned by the heat that, that was passing through. Nevertheless, we notice that the potters try to protect the masonry of the kiln by placing sherds above the duct, a similar technique to the one we saw in Aliawa with the pottery neck. The heat going out of the kiln was used in a smaller structure on the opposite side. To resume, in Aliawa and Logardan, firing systems illustrated an increasing energy use efficiency. Indeed, the heat produced by the larger kiln is shared with the smaller one for slowly drying their pots. So this technique acknowledged a high level of integration between different groups of potter on the site, transforming the clustering of different production units into an homogeneous manufacture. So the apex of this technique was identified in the last level of Logardan, where all the production is organized around two big kilns. In conclusion, these firing systems were meant to improve the production rate by accelerating the drying process and to enable potters to fire pots in a row and to work even during, dur even during wet seasons. Moreover, they reduce cost by saving fuel. 
And the question of the fuel actually is important because close to Logardan, an oak forest was available, whereas in Aliawa, we could suppose the abundance of vegetation as the mound was bordered by a stream along its northern side and a canal, an artificial, an artificial canal was dug along its southern side. However, almost no charcoal was found in the kiln's firebox, but animal dung and reeds, mostly, were used as fuel. It shows on the one hand that precious resources as wood were carefully managed by the potters, and on the other hand, that manufacturers were closely integrated in an agro-pastoral economy. Moreover, both sites were located close to clay sources, still used today for large-scale pottery and brick manufacture. Actually, this system of heat use efficiency were planned before the construction of the workplace. This indicates that several groups of potter were dealing with an important demand in pottery to answer, probably coming from the empire authorities, and choose to cooperate together by starting this manufacture. The fact that Kiln's connection was systematically employed in industrial area for pottery manufacture in the fringes of the empires show that this particular technique became a technological tradition of large-scale organized production. In addition, the text of the very end of the third millennium from the southern Mesopotamian city of Uma mentions gangs of potters called Bahar in Sumerian, and at least a part of the members were kin related and were producing pottery quite independently. They were answering to state demands and were working under the direction of the patriarch of the group. However, they could receive waste of reed as fuel from the so-called house of the reed. So showing they were integrated in a large intertwined economic network. Therefore, the data from the ancient texts match with the archeological data. In Aliawa, incredibly high quality potter's tool made of black stone were found in the late Akkadian workshop. Whereas in Logardan, a cylinder seal was found in the early level of the author workshop. This object illustrates the importance of this workshop and a probable hierarchy in the functioning. To conclude, Aliawa and Logardan are unique archeological examples permitting to increase our knowledge, not only on the firing techniques, but also on one sector of the socio-economic organization of the First Empire. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claire. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've had a couple of questions. You've, you've mostly answered them um, during your presentation, but could you just go over again what kinds of fuels were being burned in these kilns to reach the temperatures that were necessary? Uh, yes, we mainly have, so we, we did archaeological um, archaeo botanical uh, analysis in the kilns of Logardan, and we mainly have um, animal dung, actually. And it was apparently enough to fire the pottery. I mean, we need to reach uh, around 600, 700 degrees is enough for the pottery uh, that was fired there. So yeah, the dung was the main uh, resources used. Thank you. And you mentioned that um, multiple stages of firing were required to get the ceramics to the, the level of hardness required. How involved of a process was firing ancient ceramics? Um, I, sorry, I did not understand the question. No, 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 that's fine. Um, how, how many steps would it have required uh, ah, when for firing fire ceramics? ceramics? Yeah. Um, actually, the, the tricky part is the, 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 the slow drying of the pot because you have to, the, the water that is inside has to be evaporated very slowly, not to broke the ceramic. So it is the longest part. And then you have a, a step around 500 degrees which is uh, also a dangerous step where the pottery can broke. And then you need to maybe during one hour to, um, to fire the ceramic at a quite high temperature. So it's mainly like the three firing step, but the longest, if you, if you think that a firing cycle is around eight hour, the longest would be the first step of, uh, which is the slow drying of the pottery. So to go between zero and 500 degree. So that's why it's it's interesting to have uh, this uh, technique of uh, drying the pot while being fired the other more intensely in this Thank kiln. You. Thank you. And I did want to ask, um, I realized when I was reading your various introductions that um, several members of your team are interested in, in ancient economies. 
Do we know what role ceramics would have played in something like the Authory taxation system? Um, well, it was, um, I guess it was mainly, it was mostly uh, containers for um, commodities, for agricultural commodities, so food, uh, water, maybe, maybe flour, bread, uh, water, milk, I don't know, but it was more containers that uh, pottery that were used for their, um, I don't know, a religious function or um, political function. Lovely. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, is there any kind of evidence for metal production in these kilns or are they purely for ceramics? No, they were purely for ceramics. We didn't find uh, metal slags or um, no, they, they were just for ceramics. Thank you. Um, do you have any ideas about what led to these developments? Is it just a efficiency or the fact that a group of people were working together instead of uh, working individually? Uh, yes, actually, they, they were uh, to work together. They, they choose this technique. Uh, I, I mean, it's both in a, in a, in a way. They, they choose to work together. And so they choose this technique that need really, uh, I mean, you need to cooperate with your neighbor if you want to make it work. So, um, and they, they found it was the best way to produce on such a large scale because, I mean, this kind of manufacturer could uh, fire thousands of ceramic at a time if all the king were working together, which is great. But uh, yes, it was a technique that, that took time to develop, but it was uh, clearly chosen by those potters at the end of the third millennium, for, especially for large scale production. And was ceramic production, especially on this large scale, given that the kilns would obviously need to be planned and thought out in advance before mm -hmm. they were built. Would this have been overseen by a centralized authority or is this more of a, um, just a collaboration between different workers? Yeah, it's, it must have been, okay. I mean, th th these workshops were probably uh, linked to the empires. So there is, I mean, we are still working on the question because it's really recent data from a new uh, archaeological excavation, but Yes, indeed, probably um, a central authority was um, playing a role in this, uh, in the establishment of this manufacture. But um, I mean, the, the potters needed to agree on these techniques be before, because it's very a special technique that, that you need to master it. So they couldn't just impose the technique to the potters, but they had to, to know how to make it work. So it's both a question of a centralized authority and also of a grouping of people Oh, that are really great specialists, great potter specialists. Thank you. Yeah, it must have taken an, an awful lot of skill to, yeah. um, to, to do this kind of thing. Um, I have one more question, and then I was going to see if we have a couple of your collaborators in the waiting room. I was going to see if they wanted just to turn on their cameras and say hello so everyone knows mm -hmm. uh, who was involved in all of this research. Um, do we see, can you say, significant technological differences depending on geographical region. So is there a difference between like Northern and Southern Mesopotamia or is this kind of more of a universal technology? Uh, actually, we, we don't have a lot of data for Southern Mesopotamia, so we can't compare yet, but I hope a new excavation there will, uh, will uh, help to help us to understand if this is particular to the North of Iraq or if we found the same in the South. Thank you. Uh, Johnny, do you want to just uh, introduce yourself? before we head out? Uh, I'm just here to support Claire and thank you very much indeed for your presentation to Claire, uh, but it, it was a pleasure. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, really. Absolutely, and uh, Agnes, please. Uh, thank you, good evening. Uh, thank you, Claire, for your presentation. Uh, I, I would add something uh, um, about the question of Megan um, about the role of um, uh, posters uh, in or three texts. Uh, we have very few mentions, and there is a very important article by Stein Keller published in uh, 1996 uh, that mentions some text about uh, royal potters. Uh, that the um, okay, we know uh, that according to some text, uh, uh, there is a tax census uh, uh, on those potters. Uh, uh, so there, some factors are attached uh, to the uh, royal uh, uh, family. So some of them uh, resided in the city of Umma, 
recent, so we know from uh, all three texts uh, coming from UMA that uh, some of them also are attached uh, to the central authority, but there are many authors uh, that are uh, that live in the countryside and produced by themselves. So there is a differentiated um, socioeconomic system and a different involvement of those potters uh, according to the few texts uh, available. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification. That was very interesting. And thank you all three of you. Um, both Claire for that fantastic presentation and for, for you other two coming and showing your support.